Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Deborah Olashansky, and I serve as the Community Relations Director for the Jewish Federation of Nashville. And we are thrilled to have our special guest today, Ross Margulies. He will be sharing about the work that he does. He's an attorney and on a pro bono basis works with families trying to receive sponsorship to, uh, to enter the United States. And uh, we are thrilled that he has made time to join us today. And we're thrilled that he is here to share this very, very important and timely information with us. So with that, I introduce Ross Margulies. Let me unmute myself. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as, as Deborah said, my name is Ross Margulis. Uh, I'm an attorney at the law firm Foley Hoag. Um, uh, first, a, a couple of housekeeping notes. One, uh, like, like me, I assume many of you spend much of your days on Zoom. And so full permission, if you would like to not be on video, to not be on video, I obviously would love to see your faces. Um, but I also understand how exhausting that can be. So no offense will be taken if you do go off video. Uh, and uh, throw questions either in the chat or raise your hand. I know Deborah is going to be managing questions throughout. Um, and this will be, I think this is being streamed on, on YouTube. And so um, if you can't, if you pop off, you can watch it later. Um, a, a disclaimer, and actually, I think, I think maybe I might have seen my friend Rob Cohen join, who is an immigration attorney. So I will give the disclaimer that I am not an immigration attorney. Um, I'm, a, I'm a healthcare lawyer. Uh, and I, um, and I, but I, my, my practice or my law firm, I should say, prioritizes our attorneys also doing uh, a lot of pro bono work. And so I maintain an active pro bono practice, both related to my field, which is I help um, primarily Tennessee residents uh, receive Medicaid coverage, but I also um, work with uh, immigrants. Historically, that's largely been helping individuals in the United States already apply for asylum. Um, today, I want to talk to you about something very specific. So I think as, you, as, you, as Deborah noted in the introduction, we're going to talk today about what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, I will not hold myself out as an expert in everything that is happening there. But since August 15th, when the Taliban uh, invaded Kabul uh, and the U.S. began their evacuation efforts and then ended their evacuation efforts on August 31st, I have been working with a broad array of other attorneys at law firms, uh, individuals at the State Department, individuals working in nonprofits, um, largely former service members that are in Afghanistan, working primarily to get individuals that were not evacuated between August 15th and August 31st out of Afghanistan and into the United States. Um, I know we have a, a mixed contingent here, uh, only because I think I sent this to my father, and so there are some folks in Columbus, Ohio here. But uh, given this is a national call, I'll just share um, that that I think as many of you know, and I think there was a note that went out earlier this week. Nashville is expected to receive um, receive is a strange word. Approximately 300 individuals will be resettled here from Afghanistan. Those individuals are primarily already in the United States uh, at military bases, being having their immigration status processed. Uh, and they will be resettled throughout the country. And, and we, between now and March 2022, we expect um, about 300 individuals, at the very least, to come to the Nashville, greater Nashville area. Uh, Jewish Federation, Deborah can talk about this. Jewish Federation is doing great work in partnership with the Nashville uh, International Center for Empowerment, NICE, and Catholic Charities, which are the main resettlement organizations here in Nashville to put together essentially a safety net to ensure those individuals when they come here are housed, fed, um, and, and that's fantastic work. I'm excited to be involved in that. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a slightly more somber topic, which is individuals that are either in Afghanistan or in what we'd call lily pad countries. So uh, countries like uh, Qatar or UAE, Germany or France, so not in the United States and waiting to try to get into the United States. Obviously, the, in most cases, the most severe of those cases are individuals that are still in Afghanistan. Um, so um, in general, uh, when, the, when, the, when August 15th occurred and the Taliban uh, entered, the United States prioritized, uh, no surprise, and, and this makes complete sense, uh, the evacuation of, of U.S. citizens as well as individuals that had lawful permanent resident status in the United States. There was also a lot of chaos and lots of other people got out, but um, by lots of other, I mean somewhere between 
you know, 20 and 80,000 individuals. Um, and there are and remain in Afghanistan hundreds of thousands of other individuals that uh, for varying circumstances, their lives remain at risk. Um, that could be because, and I'll just give you an example, sort of a sample of who my clients are, um, female judges who um, were empowered by the United States to prosecute domestic violence cases and now are in hiding uh, and receiving daily threats from their, the former people that they prosecuted um, the, the, who are domestic abusers. Um, individuals that promoted and led nonprofits supporting female empowerment and female education. Uh, one of my clients, Ahmed, uh, has worked for five years for a nonprofit based in Herat in Afghanistan, um, running workshops to educate women and empower them on democratic values. Um, he's now in hiding. Uh, when he went out after uh, the Taliban took over Herat, uh, he was fired upon by automatic weapons and he's received a, uh, a fatwa, a threat letter on his life and on the, on the, fam on the life of his family. Um, other individuals include um, again, other human rights workers, individuals that worked with but were not employed by the U.S. government. Um, and so that's a full array of individuals that supported U.S. efforts there for, you know, the full 20 years. So, uh, you know, I, I receive and largely because of some of the work, I receive emails now daily from individuals seeking support. I can't handle all of those um, requests. And I try to work with my nonprofit partners to try to uh, help them, but they are all horrible situations. And these are individuals that are generally in hiding, that fear for their lives. And despite um, statements from the Taliban that individuals will not be subject to reprisals, we know that's not the case. Um, so um, a, a little bit of, of immigration law, and, and Rob, uh, feel free to interrupt and correct me on things. But um, for an individual who does not, was not um, employed by the United States government. So those individuals would be eligible for what we call a special immigrant visa. Those individuals have a clear path, although there, I should say that path is still very difficult. We are representing what we call civ visa holders, but those individuals will be eligible for a visa and thus legal status when they enter the United States. There are also programs called, you'll feel here called P1 or P2, which is priority one and priority two visas. Those are visas where an individual has to receive a recommendation from a humanitarian agency or a U.S. government. That's a smaller set of people that were specifically involved in U.S. efforts in Afghanistan. The population I'm primarily working with are people who are not otherwise eligible for legal status in the United States. Um, shortly after, after the uh, invasion of Kabul, the United States put out a memo the, uh, stating that it would open up a pathway called humanitarian parole into the United States. And that's what we'll be talking about today, this process called humanitarian parole. Something very important to note, humanitarian parole is not uh, legal status in the United States. Humanitarian parole is specifically designed as a pathway to get individuals facing urgent humanitarian threats or individuals that present a significant public benefit to the United States into the United States uh, on a temporary basis. Typically, that is one year. In the case of uh, Afghan refugees, we believe that will be two years. Uh, during that period, they will generally not have legal status, but will be one in safety and two eligible to apply for permanent legal status. Um, in most cases, that will be through the asylum process. And we'll, we will, uh, and Deborah, don't let me forget, I'll talk about an, an act Deborah sent around to some folks information on, on what's called the Afghan Adjustment Act. It's a, it's a bill before Congress that would uh, help expedite individuals that do receive humanitarian parole and end up in the United States uh, have a quicker pathway towards permanent adjustment as opposed to going through our firstly very broken asylum system, uh, which is a very lengthy and difficult system. Um, so humanitarian parole is so so right so essentially beginning August 31st, we so me, I'm a partner to law firm in, in, with offices in DC, Nashville, and Boston, and about 25 other major law firms throughout the country began doing intake for individuals still in Afghanistan that were facing, again, urgent humanitarian threats on their lives. And because of the role they played for 20 years, typically in supporting our mission, um, required, uh, require entry into the United States to avoid being killed. 
Uh, and that is, that is the level of threat here. We are not talking about individuals whose lives would be simply be bettered by being in the United States. We are talking about, in most cases, individuals who, if they remain in Afghanistan, will die. Uh, and, and we know that because the Taliban is, is not a new entity in Afghanistan. And while uh, there are some statements that suggest they may have changed their ways, and certainly they are now in a, you know, there's, you know, they are now in a different position as a governing entity, and they're coming up with their own struggles, right? So there's news now that ISIS-K is presenting a real threat to individuals, to the Taliban and, and, and their governance. Um, we highly suspect that these, these individuals, you know, many of whom I would say a predominant number of them are women um, who were professors and other, played other dominant roles in civil society. Uh, one, it is very clear they have no path forward to uh, a place in this new society. In other words, they can no longer work. And two, it is, it is highly likely that these individuals will ultimately be killed as well as their families. And so, um, once the memo went out from the State Department that humanitarian parole was a pathway for these individuals, we began processing humanitarian parole applications. Typically, what that looks like is individuals from Afghanistan from a variety of ways will make contact typically with a United States uh, nonprofit. That could be NICE or Catholic Charities. And it, it could be Hyatt. Um, It could be a variety of individuals. In our cases, most of our cases have actually come from a congresswoman in the Boston, Massachusetts area who received referrals from her constituents who have family members in Afghanistan. So that's where our referrals came from. Referrals are coming from all sorts of places. We do case intake um, that consists of reviewing um, documentation. Uh, I'll maybe stop there to say a sort of tragic and heartbreaking piece of what we're dealing with right now is that many individuals and particularly women don't have identification. Um, that's either because um, their husbands or spouses did not let them get identification. Um, and, and many people don't have passports. And um, we are struggling with that right now because uh, one of the pieces uh, that the State Department has indicated is that they are prioritizing in order to, because there's, so there is no, there is no embassy open in, the, in Afghanistan right now. There's no consular services. And sort of in order to have your humanitarian parole application process, you will need to leave Afghanistan. If you do not have an identification, you do not have a passport. Um, it is very unclear right now, uh, and we're advocating for some solution, what, what a possible passport looks like. So the first thing we'll do is ask what identification they have. We'll get copies of passports. We have copies of what's called their Tuscara, which is their national ID card. Uh, in many cases, we're dealing with families that range in size from seven to 15. Uh, in Afghanistan, like in much of the Middle East, individuals live in uh, family homes, right? So grandparents, parents, siblings, siblings, families. And so in most cases, we're handling uh, humanitarian parole applications for uh, large family units. Now, one piece that's important to know is that each individual has to have their own humanitarian parole application. Uh, and so the paperwork uh, and, uh, and frankly, workload and frankly cost because uh, we, the law firms are, are handling the costs associated with that, the actual filing fees, which are I think 600 or $700 per uh, humanitarian parole application. So you can imagine just even for a family of seven, you know, $4,000 in just filing fees going to the state department. Um, nonprofits are typically applying for fee waivers. Uh, we're trying to avoid fee waivers because that we, we understand that can just lengthen the process. Um, and so we will talk to each member of the family Oftentimes that involves us working with interpreters to do that. In many cases, there's one individual in the family that does speak English and we'll get um, both all of their demographic information, but we also need to get their story, right? Uh, the, each humanitarian parole application is decided on a case-by-case -case basis and each individual's risk is judged, right? So, you know, in, in the case I gave you, the, gave you the example of Ahmed who worked for a nonprofit, uh, it was very clear Ahmed was at, was threatened, right? He, his car had been fired upon. We had we had photos of the car with bullet holes in it. We had a letter from the Taliban on Taliban letterhead. Yes, they have a letterhead that um, that had his name. Um, making the argument for his family is harder. We have to rely essentially on UN reports and on the ground reports from intelligence officers that show. If you are living in the household of an individual who has been threatened, your, your life is also threatened. Uh, typically, also, these individuals will have other cases. So, in, you know, 
in the case of Ahmed, his mother was also a university professor, so she had an independent basis. So we do lots of work to put these together. Um, you may be wondering at this point, um, because I think Deborah had suggested there's, you know, what possibly can I do uh, here in the United States to help these individuals? And that's primarily why I'm here today is to talk to you about something you could do. Uh, and, and it's something that in the case of Ahmed, I learned very early on, which is in addition to filing a humanitarian parole application, part of a complete application is having a, what is called a sponsor. Uh, that sponsor needs to be in the United States. They don't have to necessarily be a United States citizen. They have to have permanent status in the United States. And they have to be willing to sponsor um, the individual or family coming over. Now, first I'll ask for a policy reason why. In general, the United States has had a policy um, a very, uh, frankly, problematic policy dating back even before World War I. Uh, and certainly this became very apparent uh, in World War II when the United States refused um, many uh, German Jews from entry into the United States on the basis that they would become, quote unquote, public charges. In other words, they would be a burden on our safety net. And the United States has had a longstanding policy of not letting individuals that come here become burdens on our safety net. Uh, and so that is where the sponsorship comes in, which is, and, and, and I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you lots of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare you at first, and then I'm going to unscare you. Um, the sponsorship came in because uh, the, the United States government and the State Department recognized that if an individual is coming here on humanitarian parole, they will require resources to be here while, they, while it is determined whether or not they can convert to some um, legal pathway. Uh, and so a I-134, which is a sponsorship form, is filled out by an individual living in the United States. Traditionally, frankly, that's been family members of individuals filing for humanitarian parole, which, which is great. Um, in the case of Ahmed, he came to us with uh, an individual who he had done some Zoom tutoring sessions with several years ago. Unfortunately, because of their own life circumstances, they ended up having to pull out of that sponsorship. And we did some scrambling. Um, my wife and I did some talking and we realized very quickly that uh, there was nothing preventing me and my wife from sponsoring uh, Ahmed. And so we did that. Uh, I started talking to the other attorneys I was working with and asked them, you know, what happens when you don't have a sponsor? Because for many of these individuals, these female judges, these um, human rights workers, they have no connection to the United States. And so while they have a very good case for humanitarian parole, they have no individual in the United States that they know that could possibly say, I'm willing to support you. And the other attorney said, yeah, we have dozens and dozens and hundreds of cases that we're basically putting on the bookshelf until we can find sponsors. And I said, what are we doing to find sponsors? And uh, everyone said, well, nothing. Um, and so we started a, a sponsorship effort um, and it's sort of loosely organized. Um, there is a Google form, which, which we'll share with you after this that I developed, which is collecting information. I'm getting people's information and then I'm passing it off, not just to attorneys in my own firm, but to attorneys at 25 other firms. Uh, I'm gonna explain what sponsorship means, but basically if you sign up to be a sponsor, within a matter of a day or two, you'll get contacted by an attorney, likely at a large law firm, who will say, I received your information from Ross. Um, and he, he's indicated that you're interested in becoming a sponsor and they will begin that process with you. So you're not committing to doing anything by signing up to be a sponsor with me. Um, except um, committing to consider the process. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what sponsorship means. Um, traditionally, uh, and if you read the I-134, uh, sponsorship um, is a serious endeavor, um, at least if you read the form itself, right? Which essentially says, by sponsoring this individual, um, I am acknowledging that I will support them um, while they are in the United States, and I'm acknowledging that if they do apply for and receive, United, receive benefits, the United States government can sue me. Um, if all of what I just said was actually true in reality, uh, then I would not be here in front of you telling you to sign up for sponsorship because I think it would be uh, ill-advised and it would not be appropriate for me to make this ask of you. Um, there are several things that have changed that. Um, one is, and if you talk to an, immig an immigration attorney who does paid immigration work, they'll be familiar with sponsorship in a, in a different context. It's a form I-864. In that context, sponsorship has been determined to be legally, um, create a legal obligation. In other words, an individual signing a form I-864, which is a sponsorship 
form for other immigration statuses is legally committing themselves to support that individual. The State Department, uh, who runs immigration services in the United States, has taken a very different position with respect to sponsorship for humanitarian parole. And in their own foreign affairs manual states that the sponsor, by sponsoring a humanitarian parole applicant, a parolee, uh, you are not creating a legal obligation either to the parolee or to the United States government. In other words, despite the plain language in the I-134, uh, there is no legal obligation created according to the State Department's own foreign affairs manual. Any immigration judge that has um, considered this issue, and we've, we have scoured for the cases, there aren't many, has found a similar reading. Uh, there is more good news. Uh, on, in September, uh, the United States government almost ran out of money, which happens a lot now. Uh, and something Congress passed what is called a continuing resolution, which is something that happens a lot now to the United States government is now funded through December 3rd. Stuck into that continuing resolution was an act uh, designed to provide benefits for Afghan refugees, including individuals receiving humanitarian parole. And so while I told you before that typically uh, an individual coming here is not to be on humanitarian parole is not to become a public benefit. The United States Congress authorized a wide swath of public benefits for individuals coming here into the United States on humanitarian parole for up to two years. Uh, and the State Department has since revised its guidance for sponsors, which says, uh, in general, an individual coming here um, will be eligible for cash assistance, they'll be eligible for Medicaid, they'll be eligible for a driver's license, they'll be eligible for refugee services, which means all of the funding that NICE and Catholic Charities and all of the other refugee uh, organizations will be receiving from Congress, and billions have now been authorized, will be able to flow to these individuals. Uh, and so, in fact, the only time period where these individuals will have a need now uh, is during the period between when they leave a military base, likely, and when they begin receiving those benefits, which the State Department estimates at one to two weeks. Uh, and so, when you sign up for sponsorship, uh, one, I'll begin by saying, uh, based on everything we know, there is no legal obligation. Uh, putting aside that, the need, the actual need for these individuals um, will be limited uh, to one to two weeks. Uh, there's also nothing uh, prohibiting anyone, for example, from uh, doing fundraisers, um, coming together as a community to support these individuals. Uh, I, I should also say, and this is a common question we get, just because you sponsor a family does not mean, or even likely mean, that the individuals are coming to the area where you live, right? So if you sign up to sponsor an individual, there is certainly no guarantee that the individual would be relocated to Nashville. And so you may actually never meet these individuals, although I can promise you, you will hold a very special place in their heart. Uh, when you sign up to become a sponsor and get connected with an immigration attorney or, or an attorney uh, pro bono representing these individuals, you will learn about their cases, you will learn about their history, uh, you'll be given the opportunity to connect with them if you like. Uh, that's that's solely up to you. So um, I, I'll just share really quick. Um, let's actually hold on. Give me one second. Um, here we go. Let's see here. Um, so uh, you know, after this, um, I, you know, Deborah will share with you a link um, to a Google form, which tells you a little more about just what I told you, which is here is what sponsorship means. Um, it'll, it'll sort of explain the basis why we believe the legal risk for sponsorship is very low. And then at the very end, it will ask you to fill in your information, very minimal information, your email address, your name, your last name. Uh, and, and then in several days, someone will contact you. Um, I, I should, let me see here. I think I can stop sharing. Um, one, one other question I get is, so what does being a sponsorship entail from a detail perspective. So as I mentioned, um, several days after signing up to be a sponsor, you'll be contacted by an attorney. That attorney will do an intake with you. Um, the information collected consists of, I, I think, two categories of information. One is demographic information. They'll want to know your name, address, social security number, passport, um, and they'll want to know financial information. Um, that financial information typically includes um, amounts in, um, in bank accounts, copies of tax returns, um, and some other financial information. 
um, and you'll sign that form. Um, another question we get is, how much money do I need to show in order to sponsor uh, an Afghan or an Afghan family? Um, the threshold for whether or not a sponsor has the capability of financially supporting an Afghan family is based on um, the federal poverty level. Um, I could probably try to pull that up, uh, but I'll give you sort of a ballpark, which is the, and you're gonna, if you don't know these numbers, they're very sad. Uh, the, the federal poverty level for a family of um, six is something like $35,000 a year. Um, and so if you are, yes, as, Jessica, as Rabbi Jessica said, it is pathetically low. Uh, and, and that's another conversation, but one we should probably have at some point. Um, and so, you know, in, in most cases, I'm not saying in every case, there will be no real financial concern about whether or not you have the sufficient resources to support the family. But even in the case of a family of 10 individuals, you would add then yourself to that. And it'd be something like $60,000 would be the minimum threshold to show. Again, it doesn't necessarily need to be income. It, it can also be in the form of assets. Um, so they'll ask about your home and things like that. Obviously. Um, I am not trying to, and maybe it sounds like I am, um, uh, belittle or make this act of sponsorship sound small. Um, one, uh, we, you know, I think submitting your financial information and demographic information to the government is, is, is something to consider. And I encourage you to talk to friends and other attorneys in doing that. Um, while I can, I can share with you my own experience as a sponsor. Uh, and actually, my father is here, and he is also a sponsor uh, for an Afghan family. Um, you know, I encourage. You know, I'm I'm happy to get on individual calls with people to talk with them. Um, I also think everyone is going to think about this obligation very, very, very differently, right? So when Leah and I signed up, frankly, I don't think I think we thought the obligation was going to be greater. Um, this was right. This was right before those. All of those benefits had been. Um, passed. And so, but in, and so we sort of asked ourselves, you know, if this family comes here, are we willing to, you know, do what we can to make sure that they can live and resettle here in a safe way? And, and we looked at ourselves and said, you know, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we have a community here. We think that community will support us in doing that. And we're going to try to do it. And, you know, in, 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 in our case, um, it felt like we just need to say yes. Um, but everyone's going to have a very different decision, and I don't want you to necessarily take it lightly. Um, Deborah, maybe I, I, you know, I've, I've talked for a good 30 minutes, um, and it wasn't necessarily always coherent, and I apologize in advance. I'm happy to, um, oh, uh, one, one other piece, because I promised Deborah I'd talk about it. Uh, there are a number of efforts. So in case you did not catch it, uh, and I apologize, you're going to have my dog for a second. Uh, in case you did not catch it, the immigration system is broken. Uh, and the system with respect to Afghanistan is broken. Um, I tried not to harp on that too much because it's very depressing. Um, people, not every individual that's in Afghanistan is going to get out. Um, we don't know yet how successful these humanitarian parole applications have been, will be. Um, the United States government has probably received 30 to 40,000 humanitarian parole applications since August 15th. And as far as we know, have processed none. Um, and we don't know what their disposition will be. Historically, it's been low. Um, and at the end of the day, the United States government is likely not, and I've talked to friends at the State Department who will say this, we're not in a position to take everyone. Um, when the Soviet Union uh, left Afghanistan in the 80s, it created one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world and one of the largest refugee crises in the world. There are still large immigration camps in Iran and Pakistan. There are three people that are three generations, four generations in now that have grown up in those countries from that evacuation. Um, what is happening now is going to stay with us for generations and generations and generations. Um, I'm focused on this because it feels like something we can do that makes a difference. Um, and, um, and, 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 but I, but there is, there is, what needs to happen also is, is policy changes. And so there are a number of policy changes underway to try to fix the system. One of those changes is a bill that I've referenced before, which is the Afghan Adjustment Act. Once we get these people to the United States, which is really the piece I'm focused on, right? Which is how do we, how do we get these people out of Afghanistan and how do we get them humanitarian parole? Getting them out of Afghanistan, and I'm happy to talk about that if folks have questions, is a whole nother topic. Um, uh, 
they will come to the United States and they will have no status for two years and will give them, give them the opportunity. And in most cases, the only pathway is asylum. If you know anything about the asylum system, it is uh, long, burdensome, uh, and often not successful. And so the Afghan Adjustment Act is specifically aimed at individuals coming here on humanitarian parole. And if Congress authorizes the act, it would authorize permanent legal status for individuals coming here on humanitarian parole, as opposed to going through the asylum pathway. So uh, Deborah will share with you, um, or has already shared with you some information. You can advocate to your, to, with your congressperson to pass that act. Uh, the other thing we are doing is trying to advocate for other administrative fixes in the system. So for example, one of the key issues that I mentioned is that right now, the United States government is only prioritizing processing of humanitarian parole applications for individuals not in Afghanistan, but there is no easy way or safe way to leave Afghanistan right now. And the countries that have land borders are not taking Afghan citizens. Uh, Pakistan, we don't operate uh, consular services in Iran. So while you get to Iran, you're uh, out of luck if you get there. Pakistan's borders are closed and they've stated they're not taking any more uh, immigrants. Uzbekistan and Tajikistan have said, said the same thing. There are still some flights being operated, albeit notably not from the United States government, but from uh, a loose formation of former service members flying individuals to Qatar and UAE. But those are primarily focused on those civ visa holders, those individuals that were actually employed by the US government. So one of the things we are working on is trying to convince the US government to process uh, humanitarian parole applications for individuals in Afghanistan by doing remote hearings uh, and then getting that individual onto a flight to the United States. There is historical precedent to do this. At one point, uh, we, you know, humanitarian parole dates back to um, probably the 70s, and we did this where we take people from Guam. We did this with the Iraqi interpreters. So there is precedent to solving some of these issues. Right now, uh, things are broken. Um, so again, I'm trying to focus on the positive, which is there seems to be some things that we can do. I can tell you there are thousands of humanitarian parole applications that will not be submitted unless we find sponsors. Um, and so I'll stop there. I think Deborah just put in the chat, feel free to drop your questions there, or we have a small enough group, feel free to unmute yourself. I think they can do that, Deborah, right? And yeah, they should be, yes, yeah. they should be able to. And I, I just wanna, um, first of all, thank you, Ross. That was a lot, I, I really appreciate you sharing all that information. You're obviously very passionate about what you do and we're very um, appreciative of the work that you're doing. And just so, Thanks, just to clarify for everyone, Ross is doing this pro bono on top of a regular, very full attorney's plate. So he is doing this really um, from the, his passion for the concern and for the issue, um, because this is this is work that he does on top of his regular work for the law firm that for which he works. So just to clarify that. The second thing I just want to clarify a little bit, because I know for several people on this call, there also um, have been involved in some of the planning calls we have had to help the folks that, that Ross mentioned, the three or 400 or so that will be coming to Nashville, that we will be helping to resettle in Nashville. So there's sort of two pieces to this. Ross is talking about the sponsorship piece, how we help the people who are still there get out. And then there's also a local effort to actually help physically resettle the people that will be coming to Nashville. So one of the other things that Ross mentioned that I think is important to remember is that historically, uh, these efforts really have re relied on family reunification, and that is not the case in this one. And that is part of why there's such a huge, uh, a, an even greater need for the sponsorship than may have been the case in prior refugee situations, because there just are not family members already here to serve as those sponsors. So. There's sort of two ways that people can be involved and assist. Um, and I hope that, it, it, I, I wanna open it to questions if there's more specific questions to understand the difference between those two things. Um, and then uh, obviously he, Ross also alluded to the bigger picture, which is our broken immigration system. So what we are facing currently in this particular Situation is just one piece of a much larger problem related to uh, our immigration, the broken system. And so that's the advocacy piece. That's the piece where we can be uh, pushing our elected leaders to try to make some changes and 
to to fix some of those problems. One of which will is through that Afghan Adjustment Act is one particular piece. But really, I think Ross has said, and it's true, the whole system really is not functioning well, and it hasn't for a long time. And uh, part of that is just a lack of will on the federal level to really tackle this, to tackle this in a real way. Um, so everything that we can do to make sure that our elected officials know that this is something that's important to us will help in that. Uh, anyone else on the call have any specific questions they'd like to ask of Ross? Again, you can either uh, put it in the chat or unmute and ask directly. And I'll also invite Rob, if you have anything, since you are also an expert in some of these areas, if you have anything that you'd like to unmute and share with us about this, you are welcome to do so. Hi. Thanks for that opportunity. I, uh, Ross laid it out very well. I, I don't have a whole lot more to add. Um, the, the only thing that I would note is that the federal government has indicated, uh, as Ross explained, some support for people who ultimately get here on, on the humanitarian parole. And so there's some question about whether or not uh, a sponsor is even necessary at this point. And that's to be determined uh, at this yeah. point. Uh, they are necessary, but we don't know. It, it could be that that uh, the government's going to fund that, and and that sponsorship will not be even as important as uh, as it appears at, at the moment. Yeah, and to Rob's point, that's absolutely correct. That's another piece we've been advocating for is given given the robust public benefits that have been made available, these wraparound services for Afghans. Um, you know, the, the I one thirty four. I mean, the plain language doesn't make sense anymore. Um, I, I was on a call with um, USCIS a week and a half ago, a state call, a call for humanitarian parole. And at that point, they still indicated there was no indication or they reiterated the need for, for sponsorship. Uh, again, I, I'm hoping um, that, but they reiterated there again that the need for sponsorship, uh, and this is now on their website, spans maybe one to two weeks, which I think is, uh, again, you know, uh, from a policy perspective, you should say, why don't we just do away with this? It's slowing down the system. Um, so uh, thanks, Rob. I think that's, that's important. And that's another area of advocacy, which is we could remove a large burden here by removing the requirements for sponsorship. Um, yes, yeah, so someone, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Schimberg posted that, yes, that this is not, neither political party has done a good job on this, that this has been by a bipartisan lack of effort to address these um, these issues. It's, it, it has spanned multiple administrations uh, for lack of real political will to really tackle um, a very complicated problem. Um, Russ, I don't know if you, you may, may or may not have an answer to this, but I'm just curious if you have a rough idea. So as, um, as I've mentioned, we here in Nashville are intending to help with the resettlement efforts for the folks that are coming to Nashville through the different sponsoring organizations, either NICE or Catholic Charity. So that those are the sponsoring groups, if you will, for these folks. And then they're gonna hit the ground here in Nashville and we're gonna help find apartments, all of that kind of thing. Do you have a rough idea? Is there any sort of a rough idea of what it costs to resettle a refugee family? Uh, so I, I'm on the board of one of those resettlement agencies here in Columbus. Um, and I believe uh, I'm going to give you some rough numbers, but I'm not 100% sure. I think the general support is about $1,000 uh, is given to the agency uh, for each individual that gets here. So that's in the normal refugee processing. Uh, what, what Ross referred to either as the P1, P2, the, the refugee processing from abroad. Um, and that's the traditional refugee resettlement issue. Um, and I think those are the numbers that, that the government generally funds uh, individuals. And then, uh, and then, of course, at some point, uh, there might be other government support uh, until, they're, until they be, find jobs and, and uh, so forth. And uh, the resettlement agencies here, here, and I'm sure in Nashville, too, uh, I know Catholic Charities uh, uh, does uh, has a, an employment component uh, to try and find uh, employment, and and the agencies here, and and I'm sure there, are talking to employers uh, to begin to to set that up in advance. Um, 
Yeah, so one wait, piece that's that's really ahead. important, uh, Deborah, is that is that work authorization is available for these individuals. Obviously, oh. that's that sort of case by case, right? Some of these individuals coming over will will one not speak English, and two will never have worked. Um, and so the other piece that's going to be critical, and I think this is where volunteers really can come in, is training, right? So I mean, I, for example, um, you know, I've been working with uh, I think it's Woodmont Church who runs computer training programs. Um, for individuals that are coming here as refugees. I mean, that's a critical resource for individuals that have never used a computer, don't know how to email. And so I think that's one area, there's not even necessarily a monetary dollar on that, but I think that's, you know, when I think about like what us everyday people can do when these people get here, it's, it's you know, one, it could be as simple as like car rides to doctor's appointments because these people, while eligible for driver's license, may not know how to drive or there's a time lag between getting a car or don't have a car. Uh, obviously, Nashville doesn't have the world's greatest public transportation system. And then there's things like tutoring, training, teaching English, literacy courses. You know, there's a whole broad range of areas in which these, you know, nice and Catholic charities will rely on Jewish Federation and and all of these other organizations. To, and I think that's where we can add key value. Okay. So, yeah, so we, we are um, part of a community-wide effort on this. Um, several different parts of the uh, Jewish community will be working on this, um, as well as those other sponsors. We also have another question. Um, yeah, wait, um, Deborah, I just want to yeah. add to that, that again, yeah. do mind, I think many of the people on the call has already signed up to volunteer, but if you are interested in doing those those missions, sorry. Um, just um, email me, maybe Deborah, you can you can write my email in the chat. Sorry. Yeah, so Michal will be um, spearheading, working with other uh, Jewish agencies locally, spearheading that volunteer effort. And I will uh, put her email in the chat, or you can email me and I'm happy to connect you to Michal, but she'll be working and with her, with her humble assistant, Alma, um, <laughs> who is... Uh, gloriously joining us today. Um, so that so I'll, I'll put both emails in the chat. Uh, Ross, there's a question about whether or not there's been a, a sort of targeted effort to reach out to Afghan uh, people from Afghanistan who are already here to serve as sponsors for those families that still need to get here. You know, I, it's, a, it's a good question and I, I, I can only answer it in my own personal experience, which is I've, I have reached out to the Islamic Center here um, I think one of the issues I've found is until I can have a sort of robust, con and, and you, you all can be my test group. Uh, my dad was my first test group. My dad, uh, Greg here, was, was signed up to sponsor, but it took even, you know, with him, you know, a, a couple of days of us talking to get comfortable with this. Um, and Rabbi uh, Jessica and Eric and I have had a separate call. So I, I think, so, so I think the answer is, I think that's a great idea. There are amazing other organizations. There's a group called ANAR, Afghan, I forget what it stands for. There's just an article on the LA Times on them, but that's also run by a group of law firm attorneys. They, that's run by a group of law firm attorneys who are Muslim Americans and they are working better. So anyways, I think that's a fantastic point. I think it's an area that probably needs to be done better. Um, again, I think we're, the, the conversation around what sponsorship means has also evolved very quickly particularly as these public benefits have run out. One other piece I'll just raise here for folks that are involved in organizational efforts, organizations can also be sponsors. Uh, it's, and, I, and we now have enough information to be able to do that. So um, a, a congregation, any nonprofit organization can technically act as a sponsor for one or many uh, Afghans or Afghan families. So if anyone's interested in having that conversation, we could certainly talk about what that means. Typically you'd submit the 990 instead of a tax return. Could you could you say a little bit about more about that? So, is it, it it theoretically would be possible for an organization like a local federation to actually serve as a sponsor as the yes. as an organizational? And so, can you say a little bit more what that looks like and how that? Yeah. Works? So, so tip, the actual the guidance now from the State Department is that you actually may not need the I one thirty four form filled out, and you may just need a letter on the organization's letterhead stating your intention to support specific intention to support the family. And meeting their needs. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that individual would relocate to Nashville, although it may. Um, but but I'm but 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 a yes. Yeah, so as long so as long as you are a 501c3 nonprofit, um, there is guidance that states that you can. And, and I, I think the the information there's not a lot of guidance on what information is needed from a sponsor. But I've talked to my other law firm colleagues, and what we're typically submitting is audited financial statements of the nonprofit and uh, 990. 
and a, and a letter on letterhead stating an intention to uh, financially assist and support the individuals when they come to the United States. Deborah, you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, yeah, so that's something we can follow up with as an organization. Yeah, There's another absolutely. good question in the chat regarding uh, specifically for folks in the LGBTQ plus community in Afghanistan, who we all would assume are facing additional trials and tribulations, is there any specific effort uh, to reach out to, to help those folks get here? Any in a sort of there is there is so yeah, I mean this that's a good point, and I you know in my in my brain having too many things in it uh, at once failed to sort of say some of the right things, which is in addition to individuals that um, you know ha have worked for worked with the US government and individuals that work for human rights organizations and individuals that are female judges. There's also individuals who are Hazara. So there's ethnic minorities in Afghanistan and there are of course LGBTQ individuals. There is an, I, I will have to email you the information, Deborah, and maybe you can pass it on, but there is a specific organization, an international organization that is working to evacuate um, LGBTQ individuals living in Afghanistan. Um, there are other interesting, I mean, just to share with you because we have a little bit of time, you know, um, we were involved, my firm was involved in an effort to evacuate the entire uh, enrollment of the only uh, music school uh, in Afghanistan. Um, much of those efforts, sadly, have all been facilitated by third party countries. Um, so the United States has been less willing and able to um, be open to one off um, arrangements. But um, in that case, those individuals ended up Portugal. Um, so, you know, the other thing we're talking to some of these clients when they come here is, if you hear opportunities in other countries, frankly, you know, countries like Finland and, and other countries in Northern Europe are, are more open to sort of these one-off immigration situations. Um, the female judges ha are, are sort of on, on a, their own sort of own track trying to get out of the country. Um, one other thing I'll share, this is sort of a, a tangent is, but just sort of gets to how broken our system is, is I'm separately working with a group of um, Afghan, uh, military pilots who were the presidential air squadron. They were the individuals that uh, evacuated um, President Karzai when he um, fled uh, and uh, ended up in Uzbekistan. And now they're um, in a camp in the UAE um, with no prospect for leaving the UAE because they didn't arrive on a US flight. Their families are still in Afghanistan. Um, I've had conversations with, and this just sort of tells you how difficult this, this issue is, I've had conversations with senior individuals at the State Department who basically have told us, you know, we may be willing to take the pilots, but there's no way we're going to take their families, um, which is a rather blunt statement and a hard statement to then communicate back to these individuals who uh, were tremendous, most of them trained in the United States. They all speak English. Um, they largely viewed um, you know, they called their U.S. counterparts their advisors, and they lar largely viewed them working, you know, hand in hand, almost as if they were part of the United States military. Uh, and um, and they are the breadwinners for their families. And so we have made an offer now to evacuate these individuals in the UAE to the United States, but have made, at least at this point, a political decision to say we're unable to take all of their families, um, which which and so they've stayed put uh, in in sort of limbo. Um, so just another, not to leave you all with lots yeah, of- Yeah, it's, it's so, it's so many really painful. So um, I also see, so Lilo, uh, my mother's also on the call who she actually came as a refugee after World War II. So uh, she, it looks like your hand is raised. Mom, did you have a, do you wanna unmute and ask a question or was the hand raised by accident? Lilo? All right, I think that may have been a, um, accidental hand raise, um, um, but I oh, but I do know that it's a, a issue that's of significance for my mother. Um, as I said, as she came as a refugee herself af, uh, through HIAS after World War II. So, Eric, yeah. did, did you have a? a I'm, I'm just curious if if I may, just as a follow up, Ross. I'm curious, has there been any explanation as to why the families of those pilots would not be allowed in to the U.S. Um, numbers. Um, the, I think, I think uh, one, one, so, I mean, and, and in fairness to the State Department employees, the, the groups at the State Department that are responsible for this area uh, are vastly understaffed compared to what it needs, particularly given that this will be the largest um, 
this once once this is all complete, this will be the largest effort to relocate individuals in, into the United States that I'm aware of. Um, and and there was a there was a stakeholder call last week um, with with the White House and the State Department, and and it's clear this remains a political priority, but it also remains clear that there is a limitation, and maybe they've just run the numbers on like if you take everyone. I, I mean, part of this is the situation we created here, which is we came into a country um, and and uh, changed everything um, and introduced democratic ideals and encouraged them to pursue um, modern liberal ideals and in doing so created a civil society that is now inherently at risk. And so if you were to take that entire civil society, that's probably a million people. Um, maybe that's under, maybe that's underestimated, right? And so I think there is not, there is a, there is a recognition and maybe this is a practical recognition that we don't have the capability to, to, to evacuate and relocate and resettle, you know, a million refugees from Afghanistan. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the focus right now at the State Department, given limited resources, has been first we deal with the people that are U.S. citizens, then we deal with the lawful permanent residents, then we do the people that work directly for us, so there's the SIP holders, then we take the priority groups. We still don't know what we're doing with the humanitarian parole people. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, it may be, Eric, that those pilots, I mean, it may be this is the right, I don't, you know, I don't know what the right immigration advice from them is. It may be that they should come to the U.S and that there may be a pathway then for their families to come here eventually. Uh, and that may be the right move for them to make. Um, but I, 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 can't, I can't answer that except that I think there's a pure numbers game here. Understood. Um, my only thought would be, I'd be curious if the Department of Defense might have an interest in the pilots and therefore might be able correct, to correct. find I mean, that a has way been our, to That has been our leverage. Families. That has been our leverage, which yes, I mean, I think there is a Department of Defense has a strong desire in ensuring there are no pirate pilots left in Afghanistan that we train uh, because we know they have aircraft uh, and the Taliban would love to be able to use those aircraft. And right now they don't have to be trained to use them, uh, except the people, we still know there are people in hiding in Afghanistan that were former pilots. Uh, any other, anyone, uh, we are, we still have a few minutes left. So if there's any other questions, you can either put it in the chat or feel free to ask directly. Um, Ross, you may or may not have an answer for this, but I think, um, you know, we've, no, there was a lot of talk about the withdrawal from Afghanistan for a very, very long time before it actually happened. But I think at least my read is no one anticipated it going as badly as it went. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on what, first, why, and also how that has affected this effort to um, to help at this point. Um, and, and others may have better thoughts. I mean, one is the Afghan government abandoned its own country uh, and fled and and left a giant vacuum and hole, um, and and it took lots of money with it, and 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 that's very sad. Um, you know, and, and, and just as just as an example, right? So these were the pilots that were evacuating the president. They got to the UAE. The president left, you know, and and left his his team. You know, the, it's both the pilots and the presidential protection squadron, uh, and and, they, and he left them and their families uh, just by promising to get them out. So I, I think the other piece. So so we um, so, so that's one piece. I think you know what I've heard from folks in the State Department is that they were relying on a lot of nonprofit partners there who were disorganized. Um, I, I just think they create, they, I think mostly it was this, this vacuum that was created when the, when the government left unexpectedly, uh, that led to a, you know, complete collapse of, of any semblance of, of civil society there. And that relied entirely on, um, understaffed, uh, under-resourced, I mean, I know under-resourced is hard to say given how much money we poured in there, but under-resourced U.S. military to, in a very short period of time, uh, do what they could. The evacuation was, I, you know, I, on the one hand, it's immense how many people got out. On the other hand, it's immense how many people are left. And I don't, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what should have been done. Others may have better thoughts, wiser thoughts than I. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just looking again at the chat to just see if there's any other um, questions. Deborah? Yes. I don't have a question, um, but I do have a deep appreciation um, for the work that you're doing, Ross, um, you and Leah, 
Um, and also for the work that our community is doing in tandem with others. Um, it is, um, it's, it's easy sometimes to wash our hands of these things because there are so many other things to worry about um, and to be involved with. So I just, I really appreciate that. And I, as you were speaking, I, um, I thought of the words of, um, of a colleague of mine um, that he had created for, for refugees. And I just wanted to share that just uh, briefly. Um, he says, Shomer et Gerim, which is from Psalms 146, um, guardian of the other, of, of, of those who are strangers. We turn to you with deep concern for those who are seeking to move from their own home, the only home they've ever known. Those who have come or who would like to come in this case, seeking survival, safety and sustenance in our country, who even as we pray these words are being tracked down, rounded up and terrorized by those who choose ruthless power over the enduring strength of compassion, help us to stand up for the vulnerable and protect the exposed with commitment, creativity, courage, and success. As we do this, may we save lives and preserve families, affirming your image reflected in each and every soul. Maseva Oz Ezra Bitsarot again from Psalms, refuge and strength, true helper in times of trouble, grant us the wisdom, understanding and knowledge to save the defenseless from all harm, to shield and sustain those at risk and to sustain our advocacy and support with your teachings of loving kindness, human kinship and faithful justice. I love that. And, and um, amen, Deborah, let me just, amen, amen. Amen. let me just reiterate also my thanks to, to you, to Eric, who is the great connector and has been so generous in, in, in introducing me to so many people, to you, Rabbi Jessica, to Michal. Um, I, I just feel like um, the, the response that I've gotten to sort of my own personal efforts here has been open, you know, ha has been welcomed with open arms and I'm so deeply appreciative of that. Well, thank you. Um... I feel like that, um, it, unless there's any other final question, um, I think we will close with those beautiful words. It was, I think that really does reflect what all of us on this call are hoping to be able to do. We see a major, um, and, and especially within the Jewish community, I think so many of us are particularly um, called to help families in these situations since so many of us have ancestors who have faced similar situations and uh, are so grateful to those that helped our families and hope to help these families as well. Uh, the effort is a long and arduous one. There is nothing simple about um, this work. Uh, it takes long, hard uh, effort. And so we are committed as a Jewish community to continue in this. Ross is, is committed in his work. And uh, for anyone on the call who would like more details, either from Ross or for us on the local volunteer effort, please don't hesitate to reach out. I posted both Michal's email and my email in the chat. Uh, and um, we just look forward to having as many people as possible, helping as many people as possible and to get as many of those families to safety as is humanly possible. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, we appreciate the words Rabbi Schimberg and uh, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And like I said, this is the beginning of a very long-term effort to help these families. So thank you all, Ross. Thank you for everything that you are doing. Um, it's really quite remarkable, the work that you're able to do on, on, in addition to everything else that you're doing. Rob Cohen, thank you for joining us today and for sharing some of your wisdom with us. And um, we will just all continue to uh, persevere in this very important work. Thank you all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you all.